Quasars were first noticed as objects which have high luminosity and at the same time an extremely high redshift. In recent years, we have been able to observe long jets extending outwards from some of these objects. Current thinking would describe quasars as old relics from an early universe. The objects are similar to active galactic nuclei that sit at the centre of galaxies. The reason they believe these objects are so old is purely to do with their redshift. But this presents a huge problem, as at this remoteness it is very hard to explain their luminosity. They would have to be 10 to the power of 18 times more powerful than our largest galaxy. There are many other problems with this distance to do with the relative speed of the gas being emitted by some of them and their movements would break the speed of light several times over, which of course is impossible. They believe that the only thing capable of powering this is a supermassive black hole at its centre, with an accretion disk that can magically create jets above the poles of the black hole. Instead, what we will examine is a common sense approach which will use our understanding gained from laboratory experiments to match this phenomena to something very real and not so distant at all. So let's find out what a quasar is in a plasma and electric universe. In the early 1960s, a lot of research was being conducted into thermonuclear reactions and the relativistic electron beams. They discovered that as they would power up these machines, the plasma would form a current sheet between the electrodes and be propelled down the chamber. As this current sheet flowed, vortex filaments would be created, which were force-free, self-pinched structures and created a helical mass plasma flow. The filaments are created in counter-rotating pairs, and as they reach the end of the electrodes, a hollow column is created which self-pinches, necking off a number of plasmoids. In this process, the pairs of filaments merge and annihilate each other through rapid reconnection of magnetic field lines, inducing currents along the axial sheath which far exceed the input current in the electrodes. The result of this process is the compression of a large fraction of the entire energy stored in the magnetic field of the initial radial currents into the volume of the plasmoid. So the volume went from about 5 centimetres, and this is the distance between the electrodes, to the size of the plasmoid, which was about 50 microns by 400 microns. More incredible is that this resulted in an increase in energy of 10 million times. During their brief 100 nanosecond life, the plasmoids do not lose any energy from synchrotron radiation. And this is where acceleration of an electron causes it to emit a high energy photon, slowing the electron down. And the main reason for this was because the plasma within the plasmoid was opaque and the electron plasma frequency, which is how quickly the electrons are oscillating in the plasma, was above the electron synchrotron frequency. And as the plasmoid continued to self-pinch and the magnetic field strength grows, the plasma becomes transparent, allowing a rapid radiation of energy. This is similar to an open circuit with the inductive field generating a huge electric field to maintain the enormous flow of current despite the rise in non-collisional resistance. And these accelerating fields produce oppositely directed beams of electrons and ions with a huge energy spectrum. The emerging electron beam is not simply made of one filament, but when examined was found to be composed of a thousand filaments ranging in diameter from 1 to 300 microns. And each of these filaments was formed of many smaller fibres, typically less than 1 micron wide, which were able to maintain their structure over several meters of propagation. Experimental tests indicate that this fine structure of the emerging beams reflects the filamentary structure of the decaying plasmoid that produced the beam. The ion beam will travel at a much lower speed due to the heavier mass of the ions. 
Observations of this beam reveal that the beam production mechanism is not a smooth continuous process. Its structure is clumped and further examination of the electron beam revealed the same structure but with a smaller spacing. It appears as if both beams were being pulsed. Eric Lerner's model of the quasar is based on this process of magnetic self-compression that we have just outlined. The initial conditions would be that of a protogalactic cloud contracting and rotating in an intergalactic magnetic field. The existence of these intergalactic magnetic fields has previously been observed by Rotony in the 80s. And this model only requires that there is a component of the magnetic field parallel to the axis of rotation. In the laboratory experiments, there will be plasma streaming against the perpendicular lines of magnetic force. This will create paired vortex filaments following the plasma in the protogalactic cloud to move through the background field with a minimum of energy loss. On the large scale, the contracting plasma disk acts as a generator, producing currents that flow towards the centre of the plane of rotation where the density is highest and then out through the central axis of rotation, which is in accordance with Alvin's galactic circuit. The in-streaming filaments follow the magnetic field lines and are therefore force-free. Initially, the current flow is symmetrical, half flowing out through the northern axis and half through the southern axis. At this stage, the pinching filaments are already storing a considerable concentration of the magnetic field energy and the magnetic self-compression process now produces more energy than does the continued gravitational contraction. The energy source for the lab version and the quasar versions are very different. In the lab, this energy comes from the energy storage device, and in the case of the quasar, it's from the rotation of the plasma disk which generates the currents. The same sequence of events that occur in the lab will occur in the quasar model. As the incoming filaments compress the magnetic field and the magnetic field continues to grow, a critical level is reached above which synchrotron radiation and axial EMF is generated, creating two axial beams with electrons in one direction and protons in the other. The symmetry between north and south poles is now broken. The large beams directed out of the decaying plasmoids creates large-scale magnetic fields which will direct incoming currents into the branch from which the beam originated, disrupting alternate branches. Just as in the laboratory, these beams are created by disrupting individual filaments which are much smaller than the plasmoid and producing short pulses of ions and electrons. So in the quasar model, at any one time, there is only a small central region which is producing the beam and radiation pulses. Lerner goes on to discuss the initial formation stage of the quasar and suggests that it would take around a few hundred million years and would compress an area of about tens of thousands of parsecs into a plasmoid of a radius of about tens of parsecs. Once the plasmoid has formed, the second stage will be where the plasmoid slowly decays. And in this process, it will release the total power of the plasmoids through the pulsing of the beams, which would last for about one year. The decay process itself would last for several hundreds of thousands of years. Now, we obviously haven't been monitoring quasars for long enough to know whether this 100,000 year model is correct. Do the quasars simply die? For me, there's a lot of potential in this model, but there are indeed some outstanding questions. The first of which is indeed, what happens to the quasars after all the energy is used up. If we assume that the same thing happens as in the laboratory, then we would expect these uh, quasars, these plasmoids, to simply disappear. They spew out all of the energy, they eject the material in either direction. At the end, you're left with very little plasma at the center of that nucleus. Now that is obviously in direct contrast to what Halton Arp had kind of put forward in terms of his cataloging of quasars. His view is very much that the galaxies ejected quasars and that quasars turned into 
other galaxies over a long period of time. The question is, is there a middle ground here? Is it possible that the uh, quasar, the plasmoid, doesn't use up all of that plasma and in fact at some stage those beams turn off and it becomes less active and, and we are left with eff effectively an active galactic nuclei with the plasma forming the galactic disk. That's potentially an option. Now we do know from Halton Art's uh, photography that there are images where there, there seems to be a connection between the host galaxy and the quasar. But the question is whether that can feed in extra material after the quasar forms, after the plasmoid has formed. And again, we don't know really what happens. What happens if you add extra material into an already formed plasmoid? Now, certainly if we look at Bostick's work, which we've covered in the past, it does suggest that there are two possibilities. Indeed, the first is that the um, plasma will join with the existing plasmoid. And the second option is that it is repelled from it. So uh, again, until we do further experiments to verify this, we don't necessarily know. The other important thing that we would need to be able to verify is these beams. Now we do know that there are quasars that emit these beams, but obviously at the moment we don't know what the constituent particles of these beams are. If we detect that they are predominantly protons or if we detect that they are predominantly electrons then indeed that does point towards Eric Lerner's model. The other thing is that the pulsing of these beams again I've covered uh, quite recently one of the quasars the, the doomsday quasar which mainstream thinks is because there is a, a binary black hole but potentially it could be because what we are detecting is the fact that these beams are turning on and off and that creates this sort of pulsing effect which seems to cause the dimming of the the quasar over a period of time again more evidence would need to be gathered in order for this to be substantiated but it certainly is a far more believable model than a double binary black hole at the center of a quasar now equally obviously this model applies to black holes and active galactic nuclei. In fact if we go along Halton Arp's theory then indeed the quasar would become the center of a galaxy. So therefore we would expect to see at the center of all these galaxies a plasmoid. Now obviously the question is how does that plasmoid then survive that long because obviously in Eric Lerner's model you're talking you know maybe half a million years before that disappears whereas we know that galaxies have existed for, for far longer. So there has to be some modification to this concept to allow the plasmoid to exist for much, much longer. And that comes back to my question about whether you can add additional material in, certainly looking at our own um, active galactic nuclei in the Milky Way, we know that there is gas clouds that are feeding into it. So the question is, does that re-energize the plasmoid at the center? or is there some other mechanism going on? So there are still many questions to be addressed. But Eric Lerner does take this model one step further, and in the next episode, what I'm going to cover his modification to this model looking at double radio source galaxies. And that's exactly the same point that, that when we looked at Alvin's galactic circuit, he was looking to try and explain that phenomena. So hopefully by being able to look at that model, we can put that in the context of what we know from Alvin and his description of the galactic circuit and also Halton Arp's concept of a quasar turning into a galaxy. Can we merge these different ideas together to form a sort of life cycle of a galaxy and the heart of a galaxy that makes sense with all these disparate ideas that, that are connected, but there are bits missing between them. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.